Let us pray. Father, it is always an honor for us to come in your house. Lord, we welcome your presence. Thank you for honoring us with your presence. And now we ask that you pour out an anointing upon this convocation, upon this congregation. Pour out an anointing upon this word that we are going to share. Pour out an anointing, Lord, upon this vessel that you've chosen to bring this word. Pour out an anointing on the lips that will speak it, the voice that will pronounce it, the ears that will hear it, the hearts that will receive it. May it achieve the purposes for which you are releasing it. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen. My name has been said, David Sepuya. Um, grew up in this church as a tiny little boy, baptized here, and uh, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in this church. Um, thank you. I came with my family, uh, my wife, Julia, my mother-in-law, Mrs. Katorobo, my son, Jason, and the other son, Caleb. Yes, our daughter, Chirabo, didn't come. So that's us. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> so the, the spirit in dealing with evil conspiracy, the spirit in dealing with evil conspiracy. This is a very exciting Month and I've seen the program you people have been following, and I believe it will be building up to something big. Um, as we, of course, um, Reverend Hillary has told us, Ascension Day tomorrow. What is Ascension Day? It's when, remember, Jesus, after his resurrection, he spends 40 days in ministry on earth, his last days, and then he ascends to heaven. Ten days later, he sends what he promised us, which is, who is the Holy Spirit. And so we are building up to that, and we're excited about it. I'd also like to invite you, there is a whole big global um, movement going on right now, um, actually beginning tomorrow, it's called 10 Pentecost, 10 days to Pentecost. There will be prayer every single day. There will be a teaching about the Holy Spirit. It is a worldwide movement involving, I think, about 5 million people. I'll send the details to uh, the assistant provost and he can share with you. Uh, personally, I've also been uh, requested to do some ministry at that global prayer. So it's an exciting time um, when we talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, the Apostle Paul testifies numerous times of the troubles and near-death experiences that he had in the course of his work. What was his work? It was serving the Lord. <clears throat> now, that, those testimonies, when he testifies, when Paul testifies about the troubles that he had, and of course we read them, to me that is enough. It is sufficient testimony to demolish the false belief or the false teaching that is advanced by some that when you become a Christian then, or a born again, then your troubles have ended. It is not true. And I've, I've heard this taught many places that no more trouble when you become a Christian. The big difference when you become a Christian or born again is that now you have someone to fight for you. That's the key thing. It doesn't mean your troubles go away, but however, they can be mitigated because of the presence of God, the Holy Spirit in your life. But it does not mean you'll never ever have trouble again, as we are going to see in the case of Paul. Personally, I consider Paul to be the greatest Christian who ever lived, but that's my personal opinion. And so let's hear this story of adversity and danger <clears throat> surrounding Paul's life. And I just want to throw a challenge to us all. How many of us could withstand or can withstand the kind of challenges that Paul went through? Death threats. Threats of death. All the time, you know. Woo, my goodness. 
the apostle Paul was facing some of the greatest dangers that a human being can ever encounter. The taking away of one's life. It was not once, not twice, but many times. I've had one such. Um, long ago, when I was still a very a small boy, during the war, or this, the war that brought the current government into power, I came from school, and there was a roadblock somewhere. That was the time when young people were disappearing to go to the bush to join um, our current president. And uh, this soldier told me, asked me, I, I produced my ID. I said, I'm a student. He said, no, I know students are part of the rebels. And so he had a gun with uh, what they call RPG, uh, rocket propelled grenade. As you can see this microphone, rocket, rocket propelled grenade at the top of the, um, of the barrel. And then he put it in my mouth. He told me, you, you know how to fire a gun? I said, I don't know, I'm just a student. He said, you know. Okay, if you don't know how to fire it, you eat it. So he puts the whole thing in my mouth. It was just a trigger, just a little press away from blowing off my head. So that's the closest I have come. But Paul saw these things many times. Um... Let's hear some of this from Acts chapter 20 to the end of um, this book of, of testimony. Acts is a book of testimony. We see Paul leaving um, Ephesus and he proclaims to the church leaders. This is what he tells them. Acts chapter 20 verses 17 to 20. <clears throat> this is what is written that when they had come, to him, he said to them, you know, from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner of, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, the plotting of the Jews. And so he's leaving Ephesus to go to Jerusalem. And eventually, when he arrives in Jerusalem, this is what is recorded in Scripture. When he arrives in Jerusalem, this is in Acts chapter 21, verses 27 to 32. This is what is written. That now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him, him, Paul, in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him. By the way, when it says laid hands on him, it is not yeah, this laying on of hands that our pastors do to us. They were tearing him apart. Huh? It wasn't the other laying on, yeah, pour some oil on you. No, they were tearing him apart. And this is what they were crying out. Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, against the law, and this place. And furthermore, he also told the Greeks, brought the Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city. That was a Greek. Greeks don't just walk around the holy city of Jerusalem. And, and so they suppose that Paul had brought into, they, they don't just walk around into the temple. That is defilement. So they suppose that Paul had brought this man. Then all the city was disturbed. All the city. Not one parish, but all the city. And the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple. And immediately the doors were shut. Now as they were seeking to kill him, as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. All Jerusalem was in an uproar. Woo. Now within a few minutes, this is what happened. You know, now they've taken him out of the temple uh, seeking to kill him. So this is what happens within a few minutes. Um, Acts 21, verses 33 and 34. Then the commander came, came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. How many chains? 
two chains. Not one. One chain is enough. Huh? Unless you are binding an elephant. But two chains. And when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. Then verse 35 and 36. This is Acts 21, verse 35 and 36. When he reached the chairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. You've seen in mob justice, what we call mob justice, it is mob injustice. Anyway, many times if someone is suspect, you know, there is chaos around the taxi park and people are surrounding, when police come, they surround you. They surround the, the suspect or the, the target. And people are normally baying and whatever. So this is what happens with Paul. They were now going to go upstairs. Remember, they had tied him in two chains. I'm imagining that these chains, it's possible. I'm just imagining that one of them was on the, on the hands, the arms, and then maybe the other one, I don't know. Maybe it was on the legs. I do not know. But the point is that here, the scripture tells us that they were going to go upstairs. Okay, in the barracks, maybe now they are going to the office of the commander, whatever it was. But because of the crowd down there, the crowd is always, you know, uh, the mob justice crowd is not ruling. And so it says here in the scripture that the, um, the soldiers carried him for the multitude of the people followed after crying out, away with him, away with him. So they, he didn't even get the opportunity to walk. He wasn't given the opportunity. The soldiers carried him. And then after that, he appears before the council. The son had dream. Um, after a brief release, this is what it says. That now, when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing that Paul might be pulled to pieces, might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. He had been released briefly, but the crowd was still mad. Now, two days later, this is what happens. We are now in Acts chapter 23, verse 12. 23, verse 12. It says that, and when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. They would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. What is neither eating nor drinking? What's that? It's a fast. It's a fast. You know people, even the evil people fast. We've heard of witch doctors and whatever, people in witchcraft, they fast because they understand the power of fasting. They fasted to kill someone. Now, such was their determination. Then now let's see at the next two verses. We are now in Acts 23, um, verse 13 and 14. Now there was... Now there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great oath that we will eat nothing until we have killed Paul. Wow. Hey, hey. I don't know that that soldier who put the thing in my and I think they didn't know how to fast those days. And so the conspiracy is deepening and then they plan an ambush. Verse 15, this is what it says. Acts 23, 15. And now you therefore, together with the council, suggest to the commander that he be brought down, that Paul be brought down to you tomorrow. And though we are going to make further inquiries concerning him, but we are ready to kill him before he comes near. 
Wow, goodness me. Then, this is now in Jerusalem. Then they send him to Caesarea. Okay? To Caesarea. Now, those of you who have been to, Jerus- to, to Israel, the, 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 um, the city of Jerusalem is more or less in the middle. Normally, when you land in Tel Aviv, that's where the big airport is, Ben Gurion, you take about 40, 50 minute drive southeast and you go, you get to Jerusalem. Okay? A distance of about maybe Kampala to Lugazi. So that is from Tel Aviv southwest to, to Jerusalem. Now, Caesarea, I've been to Caesarea a few times. Caesarea, relative to Tel Aviv, to, Tel Aviv is a modern city, but there's another, the old city around there was called Joppa. Joppa, you remember Joppa? That's where uh, Jonah took a boat from. So, Caesarea is now to the northwest, to the northwest of what I would call uh, Tel Aviv today. And so you can imagine these people are coming from a place um, in the center, middle of the city, of, of the country, Jerusalem. So he's taken up to Caesarea to the governor, Felix. That is verse 35. And there the governor um, detains him in Herod's Praetorium, verse 35. But there was a very determined man called Ananias, the high priest. Ananias, the high priest, and Tertullus, the orator, they travel all the way from Jerusalem to Caesarea to testify against Paul. And it takes them five days. So you can imagine what I've just described to you. Today, you can travel from Jerusalem. There's a high-speed train between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. And I think, you know, the, Israel has fantastic um, uh, infrastructure. You can get to Caesarea probably in two or three hours from Jerusalem. But here the scripture says it took them five days. Acts chapter 24 verse 1. They travel. The, the high priest and the orator Ananias and uh, Tertullus travel to go and testify against this man. And what was the mode of transport at the time? It was a donkey, so maybe that's why it took five days in rough terrain, determined to get their man. Now, Governor Felix, um, he fails to resolve the conflict, the dispute. And after two years, that's what it says, two years, Acts 24 verse 27, Felix is replaced by Festus. Scripture records in this verse that Felix, wanting to do Paul's accusers a a favor, left him in chains. So Felix is transferred. It's like uh, RDC of of, uh, Ntungamo being transferred, now being taken to Lira. He does not resolve the the dispute. Two years have passed. So the man is under detention and people have traveled to testify against him. He leaves him in chains and he goes to another part, maybe another part of the world. Now, so Felix is replaced by Festus. Now Festus, while Festus was still new in the job, hmm, this happens many times, a new person comes in the job, then people come to seek favor. Have you done that, friends? That now ah, there is a new MD. You know, when you're a new MD, hey, the, the steps to your office are many. The guys who were trying to cut deals in uh, 2013, they are there. And so this is what happens when a new, um, a new governor, Festus, has come in three days. On his third day in the job, the high priest and his henchmen approach him and they accuse Paul, accusing Paul, and they request the governor to summon him that long distance from Caesarea to Jerusalem. 
Okay, remember, now he's been locked up, he's been detained, that far away place for two years. And so they come, when they know there's a new governor, please let him come down, summon him on the pretext that you are going to hear his case. Let him come from Caesarea down to Jerusalem. So this is what it says in verse 3. We are now in chapter 25, verse 3. Their plot was so that they lay an ambush along the road to kill him. This is what the scripture says. So that they lay an ambush along the road to kill him. Then King Agrippa, King Agrippa, now we've been at governor's level, governors like Aradises, but now we've moved to a higher level. King Agrippa visits Caesarea, and Paul is put before him. Now, Paul had just appealed to Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus, the emperor, was in Rome, very far away. But, you know, he was head of the Roman Empire. He was the overall authority and the most powerful political leader in the world. And so Paul recounts his life as a persecutor of Christians, now to Agrippa, and his conversion and his present ministry. Agrippa and the governor Festus find no fault in him, but since he had appealed to Caesar himself, the emperor, far away in Rome, they thought that they had no power to release him, but to send him on to Rome to Augustus Caesar. But he was still a prisoner. He is in chains when he is put on a ship together with other prisoners. You can read that in Acts 21, 27 verse 1. So he's given one guard, the centurion Julius. So you've been seeing all along plot to kill him. We want to kill him. We are fasting to kill him. We want to ambush him. All these things are following Paul. And so now he gets on the ship to go to, um, to be taken to Rome to appeal before the, um, um, the, the, the emperor himself. And then they are caught up in a tempest. Their ship, they get, their ship is wrecked, um, scuttled, and they end up on an island. Now, because the tempest, the tempest is lots of rain, you know, like... I think the people around Katonga have seen a tempest in the last week. So you are in that kind of situation. You are cold, you are freezing, your ship is broken, it is scuttled, and you end up on an island. So they get onto this island, they are cold, they are freezing, and so they light a fire to do what? To warm themselves. And as they warm, as they get this wood, you know, to light the fire. In the wood is a viper. And of all people, whom does the viper go for, the snake? It is Paul. Hey, my, this man was, had so much adversity. Now the local people who had rescued them, once they saw the viper on this man's hand, they said, on our food day, he is finished. All this is in scripture. I'm quoting scripture. Read Acts chapter 25. They say, he's finito. But guess what? Paul shakes this thing off. And then they say, hey, this guy is a witch. How can he survive this? So the ambush the determined people, the riot in the city, now the snake, a viper. A viper is not a cut or anything. And so he shakes it off and um, people, uh, you know, they had been expecting him to collapse dead. So he survives. So three months later, they arrive in Rome. Go back and read the rest of this. It's quite, it's, I'm a journalist. My part of my background is, is in journalism. I, I like stories. This is a very well told story. You will enjoy it, but it is scripture. So what do we have here? This is what we have. We have beatings. The man was beaten thoroughly. We have death threats. We have 
ambushes, we have chains, we have tempestuous waters, and we have snakes. But none of this is enough to finish Paul. Hallelujah. Clap to the Lord. <clears throat> now, why could none of these things finish him? It is because of the power of the Holy Spirit. It is because of the military intelligence provided by the Holy Spirit. Some people have said, some people who interpret scripture have said that Paul disobeyed the Holy Spirit when he was warned, not once, not twice, when he was warned not to go to Jerusalem. When he leaves Ephesus, first of all, in Ephesus itself, uh, the scripture records, um, yeah, he says bye-bye to those people. Then he goes from Ephesus. Remember, Ephesus is where current day uh, um, Turkey is. Then he goes down to Tyre. Tyre is in current day Lebanon. Lebanon is the country which is to the north of Israel. And so, in... Um, when he reaches Tyre, this is what uh, Luke records in, in Acts 21 verse 4. This is what it says, that we sought out the disciples there and stayed with them seven days. This is Luke now speaking. Eh? Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. Okay? Not to go on to Jerusalem. So through the Spirit. But he continues. Then from Tyre, he goes down to Caesarea. Now, as I told you, Caesarea is to the north of Jerusalem, uh, in the northern part of, of um, Israel. It's next to the Mediterranean Sea. And Tyre, I think, is also a Mediterranean uh, port. It's even there today in Lebanon. So he goes from Tyre, he goes down to Caesarea. And in Caesarea, he meets another disciple of the Lord, uh, the prophet Agabus. You remember the one who is talked about as having had four daughters who were prophets, prophetesses. Uh, some of the very few women in the Bible who are said to be prophets. And there, Agabus tells him, um, Agabus has come down from Jerusalem, and he takes Paul's belt and he declares, this is in Acts 21 verse 11, that the Holy Spirit says, you know, he's taken Paul's belt. The Holy Spirit says that in this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. So that was a prophetic word that had come. Now, some people have interpreted it that Paul was disobeying the Holy Spirit because these two words had come. However, it was not disobedience. It was what we call spiritual intelligence. The Holy Spirit, who is the greatest intelligence officer the world can ever know, knew what was going to happen to Paul in Jerusalem. So he sends the intelligence through these disciples whom he meets in Tyre, and then also through Agabus in the city of Caesarea. And so when they urge him not to go, he tells them, no, you people, you're standing in my way. I have to go. So that's why he goes and he goes through, the, he, he, he continues on to Jerusalem and he goes through what I have just described. But it's because he had the confidence, he had the intelligence, the intelligence that only the Holy Spirit can give. So this is what Paul had said earlier on when he was leaving Ephesus. He had told the church elders that now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem. Compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. At that point, he didn't know what would happen to him. It is now when he gets to these other two people, they tell him what would happen to him.
What do we see from this? Let us remember that Paul was made a Christian by divine power, by a revelation of Christ to both him and in him. And his conversion, remember it came when his life in sin was at its greatest. He was going to Damascus to persecute Christians there. And so Paul was made uh, a minister by divine authority. Now the same Jesus who appeared to him in that glorious light and is the one who ordered him to preach the gospel to, to the Gentiles. And so Paul was on divine mission. That's one. Secondly, he had a forewarning of what would happen to him by the Holy Spirit, what would happen by the Holy Spirit through those brethren in Tyre and in Caesarea. The Spirit was amplifying the coming uh, trials uh, in store for Paul in Jerusalem. And so because of those warnings, because he had that foreknowledge that that would happen. But because he knew who was sending him, because this intelligence comes in, then he is able to go. So he was prepared spiritually, he was prepared uh, psychologically, he was prepared mentally to go to Jerusalem. Let's conclude, let's begin to conclude with a few um, lessons and then I will just speak about the Holy Spirit as an intelligence officer. One, the Spirit was given to us to guide us in all truth and he therefore knows everything including the enemy's schemes. Everything. Tell your neighbor everything. Yes, it's all known by the Holy Spirit. So let's listen to him. Let's receive direction from him Let's ask for cover from him. That's lesson number one. Number two, lesson number two is that let's keep in mind the bigger picture. Again, the Holy Spirit knows and controls the bigger picture. In Paul's case, he knew the ministry he would have to suffer. And so he did not bail Paul out at the slightest appearance of challenges as many of us are wont to do. When a challenge comes, you want to jump out of it. Now, you may want to jump out of the challenge against God's will. Hello? Yeah, some of these challenges are God's will, as we can see. So, we, from Paul's case, we, can, we begin praying, Lord, to bind, bind situations. My friend, binding God, hello? Binding God. And so the Holy Spirit did not bail him out. Hallelujah. But because he knew the challenges. When I was preparing this message, the Lord brought to me, to my spirit, took me back to the missionaries who brought the gospel to this part of the world. Those guys knew how hard it was in Africa. Alexander Mackay, who came here to Uganda, came in the knowledge of the fact that David Livingstone, David Livingstone, had died in Africa, in uh, Reverend Jafu's country, Malawi. He knew, he knew. But because of the Holy Spirit who compelled him to come, he came. Paul knew what would happen in Jerusalem because the prophets had spoken. But because of the Holy Spirit who compelled him to, to come, he came to Jerusalem. Lesson number three, in times of adversity, when evil uh, conspiracy is lurking, uh, the Holy Spirit who knows everything is actually at work. Amen. Let's give a proper hand clap of praise to the Lord. Let me just repeat the point that in times of adversity, even when evil conspiracy is around, the Holy Spirit who knows everything is actually 
at work, fulfilling his own assertion that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. That is the promise we have. Isaiah 59 verse 19. This is the confidence that uh, Paul had. This is the confidence that Alexander Mackay had. That's the confidence. Hallelujah. Um, let's begin to conclude with um, a word about the Holy Spirit as an intelligence officer. The Holy Spirit is the best intelligence officer we can glean information from. Now, let's remember that the um, primary function of an intelligence officer is to provide information. An intelligence officer may not necessarily uh, intervene directly in a situation, uh, say, like trying to stop it. He or she may not. But the main duty is to alert and uh, is to bring an alert so that an institution, a family, an individual is better prepared to face the situation. Let's take the example of um, the war in Europe, in Ukraine. Now, it is not the job of the intelligence, of military intelligence, to stop the fighting. It's not their job to stop the fighting. Theirs is to provide information or intelligence to the other wings of the armed forces, the army, the uh, navy, the air force, so that they take on these combat situations when they are better prepared. So that's what the intelligence people do, the military intelligence, provide information so that these people are better prepared. So this is what happened with Paul, and this is what should happen to us. And so let us pay attention to the promptings of the Holy Spirit because he knows everything, including what is happening in your enemy's camp. He will alert you to danger. He will give you strategies to handle the situation. And so, friends, we have been positioned for this by virtue of having the indwelling spirit. The indwelling spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so one of the privileges we enjoy as children of God is being led by the Spirit. Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of, the sons of God. And so the entirety of the book of Acts is a testimony of how the Holy Spirit guided and enabled the first Christians to fulfill the, the task they had been given. The Holy Spirit is the way that God is with us all the time. He is the way God supplies intelligence to us. We don't even know what he looks like. However, this is what Jesus told us. He summed it up in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 8, where he likened the Holy Spirit to the wind, something you can feel but not see or touch. So let us feel the Holy Spirit. He will help us in times of adversity. Let us use him, and then we shall overcome. Thank you very much, and God bless you.